Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Each week, and now for 15 years, EWTN has given me the privilege of introducing to you men and women who, following the lead of the Lord, uh, either intellectually or in their heart, have been drawn home to the Catholic Church. I mentioned 15 years. This is an exciting program for me. This is the, our first show of the 15th season. Uh, we began the program back in September of 1997, and as for this, I've invited back a friend who's been on the program. It's been a couple years. I want to find out, remember when exactly you were on, Ben, but Dr. Ben Alexander, former Episcopalian. He's a professor of English at Franciscan University. And well, first, Ben, welcome Good. back to the Thank program. You. Marcus, it's, it's great it, to see you. <laughs> it's wonderful seeing you again. I know. It's, uh, we don't see each other enough. Though I see you occasionally coming through the halls at the university. That's right, and uh, it'd be fun to never have enough time on uh, the journey home to get through everything we would love to talk about. But besides our faith, you and I also share a, a love of literature and a love of music. We could we could spend a long time talking about yeah. either. Yeah, I remember our days uh, with the Dogmatics. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be a reunion concert. Uh, Maybe maybe this year. Yeah, we just you just broke the cat out of the bag mentioning the dogmatics on the <laughs> Journey Home program. Uh, we at Francis University for a while we had a uh, a small group of professors and, and and they lowered themselves to allow me to get on the stage with them. Mm -hmm. I played keyboard. Dr. Mark Maravalli played a, a mean saxophone, you and did. you were on the drum right. band and. Right. Uh, even Dr. Scott Hahn plays a mean guitar, so yeah. it's uh, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. That's been 15 years, though, but at least just at about. least it's been uh, early 90s. I think was the last time. It's, it's, time. it's time. Although our music, we're bringing it back out of the dust, but I think those students would still enjoy our music, but mainly blues and jazz, and, and that's great. But it's good to have you here, Ben. What I normally do when I invite back a guest is. Uh, give the audience a bit of a reminder of your own journey into the church, because you were originally Episcopalian, is that right? Right. I was Episcopalian. I came into the church uh, in the uh, spring of 1991, so it's been almost 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, but I was um, you know, heavily involved with the traditionalist movement to preserve the liturgy, uh, the old uh, Cramnerian, Shakespearean liturgy of the Episcopal Church, and uh, tough battle. It's a tough battle, and things have uh, proceeded apace from then. So, uh, I was sort of one of the er earliest waves of people, who, uh, disaffected Episcopalians, yeah. you might say, who who saw doctrinal, liturgical, uh, dogmatic problems with the positions of the Episcopal Church uh, that uh, led to a lot of us to come into the Catholic Church huh. and. Uh, so I've, I've been in the church now for 20 years. Have you, as you look back to the Episcopal Church now, here we are 20 years later from the time you came in, do you see it going in a, a positive direction, more negative on the trajectory that it was when you were in it? Or? I, I think the, uh, the basic uh, conflicts are the same. They have a different, uh, maybe a different uh, tenor or a different face but uh, there seems to be perennial issues uh, of the Episcopal Church's positions on, for instance, on ordination, on marriage, yeah. and things like that that uh, continue. Uh, I look back like Cardinal Newman with a great deal of love. I love the, uh, what the Episcopal Church was. Mm -hmm. uh, I think its liturgy uh, that was written in the Elizabethan period is the most beautiful liturgy ever written uh, um, in some of the services. And as I understand, I'm not an expert on this, but I understand some uh, Anglican use uh, parishes are now in being, yeah. where are there large groups, I don't know, I think there's maybe one in Texas that's coming in. That's right. Or has there's been in. one in Texas for quite a while. There's actually one in, uh, in Boston area. Yeah. Um, I don't understand the, uh, the the nuances and the complexity of it, but I think the current pope, for example, has got a committee or a group that is trying to help disaffected Episcopalians yeah. uh, who, uh, you know, are uh, not in line with some of the uh, teachings of the Episcopal Church. 
So it, I think, you know, so I, but basically after 20 years, I look back with a great deal of fondness as an ex-Episcopalian. I, I, I love what the Episcopal Church meant to me yeah. uh, for, you know, a good, all of my life until 1991. Yeah, the ordinariate, the Anglican ordinariate is what the Holy Father has, has uh, opened for, especially returning Anglican priests who are bringing with them a part of their congregation right. to establish Anglican use parishes like you're talking about. Right. And part of the reason was to appreciate um, the patrimony that they're bringing with them. And a part of that is the, the, the wording in the particular liturgies of the of the older liturgies of the of the Anglican Church. Yeah, and I think that's what the Episcopal Church has to offer. Uh, you know, the the Roman Catholic Church. If if, and this is there are many Episcop Episcopalians that see their faith through the liturgy. They're very attached to it. Yeah. Uh, whereas you know, a Catholic is uh, is attached obviously to the sacraments, uh, and he may be disappointed in some of the translations or some of the English wording, but, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, the sacramental reality is what brings him into the church, right. whereas many Episcopalians are still very much at a, at a, tied to that local parish and the memory of that local parish and the liturgy uh, that they heard for years, and they memorize. Yeah. Almighty God, unto you all hearts that open, all desires known from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. That's the beginning of the... Of the, uh, of the Liturgy for Holy Communion. I still remember these things. And as I tell my Shakespeare class, you know, I came to Shakespeare through the Anglican Liturgy. You know, in other <laughs> words, I had I'd heard the cadences and the languages, language for many, many years, and it, it deeply embedded in the consciousness. And then what, what little I could learn about Shakespeare in college, for example, it was an easy transition into that poetry. So what I'm saying is many Anglicans uh, yeah. re recall this, and that's how they look at the church. And so that's a very, very adroit and I think resourceful way for the Catholic Church to address Anglicans at that level. And there are many of them. Hmm. And it's probably parallel, again, to lifelong Catholics who yearn for the liturgy the way they remembered it when right. they were young. I mean, right. so it's, it's very akin to that. I don't have that same attachment in either case, whether Catholic or non Catholic, because I came from such a my Lutheran upbringing, I remember that liturgy, which is very similar, but it, it isn't the same. But I think that the church is recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit there, but yet helping you, as you say, appreciate that the liturgy is one thing, but the sacraments are another. Right. You don't sacrifice the sacraments just so I can go back to the old liturgy. The sacraments are where the grace is at that you that's, receive in that beautiful liturgy. That's true. And that, that's one reason I, I, be, I saw that. That's one thing that why I became a Catholic 20 years ago. Um, uh, that, that was so, so sort of, uh, is, you know, when you're an Episcopalian, uh, one of the things that, uh, that crossed my mind for many, many years when I received the host, it says, this is the, you know, the priest would say, this is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And, and, it, and I sat there and I said, what is it? Is, is, <laughs> it, is it a memorial or is it the body? Yeah. I kept hearing this and hearing this and hearing this. And finally, uh, really through, uh, I would say through uh, just a, a subliminal decision I had to make that, uh, I mean, I didn't go read a track on transubstantiation or something, but I just came to the conclusion that it could not be one or the other. And that's the way, um, as beautiful as the Episcopal Church is, in its liturgy, it does have a lot of room for ambiguity. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it had on, to be that way. On, on, uh, the, uh, really, really crucial issues, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of people talking to me, even to this day, will say, oh, the Episcopal Church is really close. It's very, very close. And I said, yeah, it's really close, but it's really far away. <laughs> they said, it's far away. It looks just like it. And I said, well, that's kind of like saying, you know, uh, a minor league baseball team looks like the New York Yankees, you know, it kind of look like the Yankees, but it's not quite the Yankees, you know, and uh, that's, that's... You put uh, them on the same playing field at the same time and you'll find out they're You'll not find the out, and one of the most interesting <laughs> things growing up, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, maybe as a teenager or something like that, uh, 
someone said to me, he said, well, you know, somebody said, maybe it was in college, somebody came in and said, we're just the JV squad for, for, <laughs> for the Catholic <laughs> Church. And that always stuck with me, you know. I didn't like hearing that at the time. Right. Uh, you know, and I took umbrage. And um, for many years before I became Catholic, you know, I would, I would uh, get in debates, and I, I believed in that so-called bridge theory that, uh, sure. that I was Anglican Catholic, and I called myself the Anglican Catholic. So when I got in these debates with my Roman Catholic brethren before my conversion, I said, I am a Catholic. And so I, I think a lot of Episcopalians entertained that for a while, that sort of bridge theory that the Anglican Catholic Church is, in fact, uh, the universal church. But then, as I said, these, uh, these, issues, these issues of ambiguity creep up in, off, often, and you have to make some sort of decision. Yeah, well, Newman was trying to find that middle way, right? He was trying to right. prove that middle, middle way, the via, via media. media, and right. in the end, had to come home. Right? Right. And that's the, the point of that. Um, it's interesting, then, that, you know, you're an English major, and it seems to me that that words are important to you. It's almost like that's one of the reasons that you had to become Catholic, because words are important. Do they mean what they mean? Right. Or, is there, or can it mean a bunch of things, the ambiguity that could be there? But you're saying, no, 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 what does that word mean? What does that mean? And, and as an English liturgy, uh, litur uh, literature scholar, words are important. Right. Yeah, they're, they're really important. That, that's where I think the, uh, what was really disappointing about what, what happened in the Episcopal Church. Uh, they had, uh, you know, the Episcopal Church were, custo were custodians of this beautiful liturgy that was crafted by Thomas Cramner. And uh, it, was, it, was, it will always be remembered as not, not just as something antiquated and, arc, you know, and, and uh, specialized in a literary way, uh, something for a museum. Uh, but something really, really clear in English that spelled out uh, in beautiful ways certain doctrines. Uh, so when that began to change, that was a, a big disappointment to uh, to me, and uh, that's what the, this traditionalist movement was was about. Uh, we we essentially lost the battle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's what it was about to to preserve the the, the articulation of the language. So it was really important. But uh, that's what's good about the uh, you know the Catholic Church is a different uh, model of, of church governance. You know uh, you you don't have a lot of room for ambiguity when it comes down to uh, faith and morals. You know there's 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 yeah. um, it's pretty clearly enunciated. It's a different model. It's not a democratic model. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's it's a it's a ruthlessly hierarchical model of church government, and yeah. that's the way it was set up. Yeah, and, and for good reason. If you look at the very first line of the Catechism, it says that the pur since I, I, I'm quoting it wrong, but basically the purpose of the church is to guard the deposit, right? Pass it on. So that hierarchy has been established to protect, and all through its history, the importance of words. Uh, the early councils, homoousius, what that means. Uh, and not mother of Christ, mother of God, as another definition, you know, that was important. Transubstantiation, to help us understand what's going on. There's not a lot of wiggle room to really understand because wiggle room allows for the trajectory of confusion. All right. Well, where I really began to see this, too, is, is, is uh, through a writer that I've been working on for many years uh, and, and working on her letters, that, her unpublished letters, uh, Flannery O'Connor, who is... Uh, She's been a favorite of yours for a long time. Uh, and many others. I mean, yep. uh, she is changing the face, as we speak, of American literature and has so pretty much in the last 20 years. But in her beautiful edition of letters... Um, she has some uh, called a habit of being, and they've been re uh, represented in her collected works in 1988. But she's got several friends, among them Robert Lowell and uh, certain other English professors, um, uh, that, that that are write write her saying, you know, I would become a Catholic, uh, but um, they they write her horror stories about 
a bad sermon they heard, uh, uh, bad manners of a priest, uh, bad behavior of a priest. And she always writes back to them and says, you know, you cannot judge the church through uh, bad experiences of, of, of clergy or of bad sermons. She says, that, that's not really what the Catholic Church is about. She says, the Catholic Church is about, as you said, a deposit of faith, uh, a community uh, of faith that is promulgated and defended by the Pope. And uh, she, said, she says, you know, there's certain dogmatic principles sacramental principles that have nothing to do with a bad sermon, you know. Uh, and, and she says, so you've got to see the church through that, through that lens. And she, she says this time and again. Um, she has that one quote about uh, the mass is a mass, even if it's said in a boiler room out of a suitcase. Yeah. I, I forget that little yeah, quote. It, it, uh, she said, it, it, and that has to do again with with the emphasis on the sacraments, and she told Robert Lowell, you know, uh, Lowell uh, had a dramatic conversion that she hastened in 1948 when they were both creative writing students at this artist community called Yaddo in New Saratoga Springs, New York. And Lowell uh, became a Catholic and then turned around and a year later uh, wrote Flannery a letter saying, you know, I can do more good outside the church. And uh, she was deeply disappointed, and she had a number of friends that quit. And she said, the main thing I'm worried about with you is the vicissitudes of your personality, which was proved to be very true with Robert Lowell, uh, who had a manic personality. And she said, I'm also worried, secondly, because you're going to be cut off from the sacraments. And she said, the sacraments give grace, that's all I can tell you. And she would tell this to numerous uh, correspondents, intellectual professors, uh, Jungians, uh, Freudians, uh, people who were interested in uh, symbolic action and fiction. Uh, you know, they would write her letters and, you know, say, uh, again, complaining about behavior of people in the Catholic Church. And she would say, you're not really, you have to go up to another level. You have to go up to the dogmatic doctrinal level to understand what the church is. And um, she was a tremendous catechist yeah. uh, to a number of people. In some of her letters, I was rereading them this summer, uh, some of the most beautiful letters uh, in, uh, written in defense of uh, uh, the, the dogmatic uh, mysteries of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Uh, she was a great, tireless defender of that. Yeah. I've read, I think it's called the American Library version. The one volume of her writings has got most of her, I think it's got all of her books and then it's got a collection of her letters. Yeah, that's the Library of America. Yes, yes. Huge thing, yeah. Yeah, I've read that. And uh, in fact, that her, the books I've read three times just so I could get them. You know, I mean, I could get it. It took right. a while for me. Maybe we could even talk about that. But I think the letters you're talking about aren't in that, right? No, I'm doing letters uh, that it's, it's, it's a fascinating group of correspondence. Um, it, it's, and what's unlike the uh, Library of America collection, this is a group of connected correspondence. And let me, let me just enumerate them. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the letters uh, that I found at Duke that were, that were on deposit there. Uh, between Flannery O'Connor and uh, James McCown, who was a Jesuit. Uh, and I mean, and the other thing, uh, he had a brother who was also a Jesuit, Robert McCown. Um, and anyway, the McCown brothers are really, really instrumental for introducing Flannery O'Connor to the church, to the clerical community in the 1950s. Uh, because one of uh, Flannery's early essays uh, was published in the journal America. And then uh, the McCown uh, brothers, uh, well, James McCown, uh, got a whiskey salesman from his parish in Macon, Georgia, to drive him out to uh, Milledgeville. <laughs> and he just knocked on the door. And this beautiful woman in loafers and... Uh, you know, Blue Jeans opened the door and said, howdy. And he said, I'm here um, because I read your stories. This is about 1956, January 1956. I read your stories. I'm here 
to, to tell you how much uh, I like them. And she said, you're, a, you're the first uh, priest who said uh, a turkey dog to me about my stories was her phrase. Is that right? Yeah. And so you have this So long, she had not been appreciated during her writing period until then? To this then. day. To this day. Yeah. Uh, she, she, she's not well understood by the official church. It's, things are changing. For example, in 2000, her stories were uh, banned from a required reading list at a Catholic high school in Louisiana, which would have been uh, just, it, it's, an, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. bitter irony. Yeah. They might uh, include Catcher on the Rye, but not Flannery O'Connor. Well, uh, <laughs> there was, you know, there was one, there, there are certain racial terms that you find in Twain, you find Faulkner, and you find in O'Connor. Uh, that become uh, sort of coercive terms just because they appear that sure. people take them out of historical context. Right. So that was the thing that was fueling it. But, um, uh, you know, I think she should be required reading in seminaries. Uh, she's not. I think those letters, those catechetical letters I'm mentioning, should be required reading in seminaries. Mm -hmm. She's not well understood in the official church nor in the uh, parish level of the Catholic Church because... Uh, like all good writers, you have to have a good teacher and you have to know where to start. And the problem is uh, many people start with, with some of her violent, uh, bizarre stories. And, and, and it's kind of like, um, uh, what if you were reading the Divine Comedy and you started with Dante's Hell and, and no one was there to tell you what was going on? <laughs> And you, you might get a bad impression of, about Dante. You know, this guy's bitter and, and people are being frozen to death. And people are being maimed. All these terrible things that happen in the, in the, in the Inferno. Well, if you, if you don't have a good guide, you know, uh, yeah. you, you can get a, a, mis a misimpression of what O'Connor is about. But, um, you know, she is a woman that was on the cutting age of the early age of television, this medium. And she studied television as a writer, and she said, she said you know, uh, in, in this television age, people uh, understand violence. And uh, so she would use violence as a tool uh, to basically get one's attention to a larger doctrinal or dogmatic truth that she wanted to present in the stories. That might be interesting to encourage the audience. I mean, why, why should they, if they're interested in literature, read Flannery O'Connor and appreciate her as a great American writer? Because as Ralph Wood, who's one of the great uh, scholars of American literature, uh, she is the first uh, avowedly unapologetic uh, Catholic writer who is, in a sense, uh, is, is as canonical as someone as Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, she is the first orthodox doctrinal Catholic writer to be afforded that canonical status. And she does it not as a Catholic, but as an artist. That is to say, she writes beautiful. She says, uh, you know, whether people, um, I want to, I want to, I want to make my mark as an artist, as a well, as a person who makes a beautiful story. And then the, uh, the Catholic essence or the Catholic teaching is a byproduct. She learned this from her teacher, Carolyn Gordon, who, who, who said, I came into the church mainly because uh, I was a person who learned, how to learn, who learned how to craft the language that took me to the truth hmm. of Revelation. So, so O'Connor is that kind of writer, you know, who, um, who occupies uh, a place as important, it seems to me, as Poe or Emerson some of these more heterodox writers or faithless writers of the 19th century, here you have this huge figure in the 20th century. And since I have, you know, in the short span of time I've been teaching literature, and this is true at uh, Franciscan University, and you can see a number of other colleges where you will see courses, and this wasn't true 20 years ago, but you'll see courses now, and maybe a survey could be done, I haven't done it, but a survey where you have a specific course on, on Flannery O'Connor and her circle, um, you know, in the curriculum. And these, this is because uh, there is kind of a, uh, that, that's the canon speaking. They're recognizing the power of this woman mm. and the power of her vision. I might have to also uh, maybe make an encouragement 
as you said, okay, sometimes you drop into a, a writer's corpus of writings. If you land in the wrong spot, you can get put off. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of, like I said, I've read her stories. A number of them are even hard for me to try and summarize. I remember the one short story where it's a woman and her husband and their kids, and they wake up in the morning, they decide to go for a drive, and they end up out in the middle of nowhere getting killed right. by the, 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 misfit. The, the misfit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there, it's like, can you imagine someone reading it and say, well, what is this about? What's the point of this? Okay. Where should someone begin with Flannery? You can't understand that story, okay, unless you read the cycle of which they're a part. Okay? A good man is hard to find in other stories, 1955. If you take that out and stick it in anthology, you say, okay, this is, is, is an Episcopal priest said. What do you mean this is about martyrdom? What do you mean this is about St. Stephen? <laughs> this, it's about martyrdom. It's about a woman who gives her life, blood martyrdom, to convert this killer who doesn't have any uh, real meaning to his life. There ain't no real meaning in life, he says. So this woman, who's kind of a silly old woman, uh, comes out of herself at the end and forgives him the murders. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's a story that, that is the pathway into seven other stories, all of which have to do with the sacraments. For example, you have the first story, which is A Good Man is Hard to Find, which is about uh, radical faithlessness. Then you have the second story called The River, which is really oh, a rendition yeah. the of... The baptism's in that, right? Was yeah, it, it's yeah, really yeah. a rendition of the, the misfit as a young kid. And, uh, 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 but this is where the misfit, um, when I say he's a rendition, it's a young, uh, very deprived young man who hears the literal promise of baptism and takes it literally and really swims in the river to try to find the kingdom of Christ. It's a highly symbolic story, but it's about, unless you become his little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you have adult faithlessness, first story. Second story, childlike faith. And then you begin to get into her marriage stories after that, mm -hmm. a stroke of good fortune. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to think of the other one, uh, but there's um, the life you say may be your own. Yeah, yeah. So that the sequence of A Good Man is Hard to Find and other stories are about the hard, difficult work of sacramental living. Mm -hmm. And it starts with faithlessness and ends with purgatory. The last story is The Displaced Person, mm -hmm. you know, and it's about uh, another uh, matriarch who doesn't know what the crucifixion is. She says in that last story uh, to the priest who's trying to sell her, tell her about uh, the crucifixion, she says, I don't really have time for that. You know? <laughs> I've got important things. I've got this farm I've got to run. I've got this uh, Polish man who's, uh, you know, I have to pay extra to. And she says, I've got to pay him extra all the time. Well, he becomes the uh, crucified at the end of that story, yeah. run over by a tractor. Mm -hmm. And you have a collusion of classes there at the end who watch his uh, crucifixion. And she actually, at the end of that story, uh, understands the crucifixion for her. And it's overwhelming, you know. Mm -hmm. And she ends up suffering. Uh, in a, in a, she ends up, uh, she has some sort of stroke at the end. And the priest is still coming at the end uh, saying, now, where will we... Uh, where were we talking about purgatory last week? <laughs> so you go, uh, if you understand the sequencing of the stories, okay, as an introduction into the uh, sacramental conflicts of life, then you've got that. But if you just take The Good Man is Hard to Find and stick it in an anthology, it, you lose. Yeah. In other words, I would never teach it, uh, I mean, I would teach it when I do teach it, I always teach it as part of this collection. But if you just do the cafeteria approach, uh, you're you, going to miss the, you, you the, miss the point that she intended. That for she her intended. Collection. Yeah, yeah, that she intended. Well, short of coming to Franciscan and taking a course from you, if a person's out there reading, are there books that explain this background to Flannery's writings? 
Well, uh, you know, where did I would... she do it herself? Did she, she does a lot in her letters. I, I think the, uh, the letters is a... Uh, is a good place to begin. Because she was probably answering these very questions to readers who were writing her letters oh, saying, what did you mean by this? Somebody wrote her a letter, a professor said, we, we, the class has concluded that the wreck and a good man is hard to find was actually a dream. It never happened. It was, it was a figment of somebody's imagination and the murder was not real, it didn't occur. And she wrote back a letter and she said, nothing could be further from the truth. You completely missed the point of the story. The story is about martyrdom and faithlessness, and you just you're just not getting it. So, uh, uh, where you begin with O'Connor, I think, is uh, is to try to uh, um, uh, familiarize yourself with the catechetical, dogmatic, apologetic voice in, in the in the habit of being or the collected letters. Then you're more prepared to deal with the, the, her use of violence and, and the stories that she that she, she that she does. Right. Uh, but reading her alone, uh, without any preparation, is very very difficult. It's tough. It's tough. We're going to take a break, Ben. When we get back, I would like to also talk about Walker Percy, uh, but I also like to talk about the power of liturgy to bring people to appreciation of the beauty of our faith. Okay. Okay. When we come back, so see you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host. Our guest for this first episode of the 15th year of uh, The Journey Home uh, is a good friend, Dr. Ben Alexander, professor of English at Francisco University. You appeared back in 2000, so it's been, been 11 years been since, I've, since I've had you on the program, Ben. Let's step back into what we were discussing before the break, and that is uh, the good Catholic writer, Flannery O'Connor. Would she have considered herself a Catholic who writes or a writer who's Catholic? She would, she would have considered herself uh, assuredly a writer who writes. Um, she, she got this from Maritain via uh, Thomas Aquinas that something... Jacques Maritain, who's yeah. a convert himself, right? Yeah, I yeah. don't know whether Maritain... I, I, I don't know. I was thinking he was, but... It may, it may not, but um, what she basically believe that, like, like she had a lot of friends who were not Catholic, who were very fine writers. Mm -hmm. And she didn't push religion on them. Uh, she talked to them, uh, you know, she accepted them as fellow craftsmen uh, and admired them and talked to them. Now, if, if they brought up the faith or asked her questions of the faith, or in some cases just missed the point of the stories, that would be the uh, way that she would go into what she was doing. And one of the great powers of Flannery O'Connor is there are an enormous number of critics who are not Catholic. Uh, um, there, there's a, a gentleman uh, whose uh, uh, his name escapes me right now, but he was a very fine critic um, uh, who is from India uh, by, by background. And uh, he and people like him uh, appreciate her uh, for her sense of humor, her use of the language. Uh, there is a book uh, by Lance Bacon called Flannery O'Connor and Cold War Culture, which is a study of the 1950s, how she, uh, her, how her anti-communist views got into her fiction. So she, she's, uh, uh, she is at one level appeals to a wide audience who are not particularly religious, which yeah. is part of her genius. And then, of course, uh, she appeals to a lot of other people who are Catholic or Christian and are read her uh, from that dimension. So there's layers to her writing. Yeah, she's like, uh, she's like any great writer. Like, like she's, there's only a, a handful of people who can do this. Shakespeare is one. Faulkner is one. I mean, you don't have to know. The French, for example, came to William Faulkner 
uh, not because of his knowledge of Mississippi. They came to him because they were, uh, a lot of them were members of the French underground in World War II. Uh, his books were inspiring because they were about rural people enduring problems of their own uh, with heroic contours to their life. And uh, so, so they spoke to the French underground. Uh, Faulkner spoke to them as, as a heroic writer. So there, you know, writers like this have uh, multiple audiences. You know, they have yeah. secular audiences, they have uh, southern audiences, they have Catholic audiences, and that's, that's a mark of a true genius. Not where you just carve out a niche and say, quote, like uh, O'Connor would have never accepted the term Catholic writer. Uh, she would have been uncomfortable with that. She, she would have, uh, she, she conceived of herself as a writer who was uh, exercising uh, a craft that she was a gift of God that she said she was really good at. And this craft would then allow her to demonstrate and dramatize sacramental themes. Is... Her deep Catholic convictions were the grid out of which her writing came. I mean, she wouldn't contradict her Catholicism, I don't mean in terms of, of uh, writing an apologetic, but it, her, the philosophy and the theology of her Catholicism fed her writing. Right, just like it has. I mean, I think most Catholic writers, uh, uh, baptized Catholics, uh, cannot expunge or get rid of the Holy Spirit that's as part of their DNA. It depends on how hard they try. For instance, James Joyce, the great Irish Catholic rebel, yeah. uh, he, his whole career was let me get over being an Irish Catholic. Well, that's like telling me not to speak in the inflection that I speak in, you know. Uh, I cannot stop my, uh, my, my intonation being from South Carolina. You, you cannot get rid of James Joyce's Irish Catholicism that's in his DNA, so while he's disavowing Catholicism, he is also, in his fiction, writing some of the most beautiful passages about being trained by the Jesuits in Ireland. <laughs> you know, in, in perfect, beautiful Latin, for example, that he's able to write. So that uh, you, you can't, rebel Catholics is kind of a paradox. You know, that's kind of a fashionable thing for a lot of writers to say, uh, the church is a hindrance and it's oppressive and you've got all these people telling you rules and, 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 and I, I don't like being a Catholic and I want to rebel, rebel against being a Catholic. That's, that's one of the great recipes in modern literature, very fashionable. Uh, O'Connor is of, of, of an entirely different uh, persuasion. You know, she's at ease with that Catholic DNA. It's deeply embedded. And you see that in her letters. And she's, yeah. yeah, you see that in her letters. Deep. The, anybody that you know of ever convert to the church as a result of reading Flannery? Well, uh, I cer she certainly had a huge impact on my conversion, yeah. uh, simply because I, I began to see uh, the, the sacramental life. Now, I have also taught her in a number of Episcopal parishes, uh, reading groups, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, inevitably, uh, people come up and say, well, this, this woman has really deepened my faith, uh, has really deepened uh, my appreciation of the sacramental life, uh, you know, and, and that could lead, uh, you know, you can rejoice in that. That could lead to their uh, going to another communion. It could also simply deepen their appreciation yeah. as a Christian. So that um, I, I think if you read her letters and read her fiction, and it, it, it can have an, uh, definitely move your heart, because uh, the, the choices that she uh, uh, repeats in her fiction are so fundamental. You know, as the misfit says, there's only two things you can do: you can either follow Jesus, or you can spend your time burning down somebody's house. <laughs> that's a paraphrase. Uh, but that's what he says. There's, there's two choices in life, and these choices are repeated over and over again. Uh, that there's a fundamental uh, sort of Thomistic choice uh, for God that has to be made. Well, even as you did the, the accent to the misfit there, that also says something about where she was writing. She was a part of the Southern writing 
tradition, which was really a Bible Belt tradition. So mm -hmm. a lot of her writings, you know, use that as the story. Catholics in the midst of a very strong Protestant world with a lot of Protestant ideas about the Bible and about religion, that's brought out in her stories. As well as you mentioned, Flannery and her company. I mean, she had a lot of key writers that were around her during that time period. Yeah, she's kind of the tip of the iceberg in the mid-50s. Uh, a lot of people around her that are not really as well known and, and she would have been surprised, I think, in terms of what happened to, in, in literary history. But for example, um, there's a very, very powerful Catholic convert that read all of her stories. It's not, she's not very well known. Very great teacher of writing, Carolyn Gordon, who was, uh, you know, she figures very heavily in the letters I'm editing. Uh, I have a lot of letters where she, uh, I mean, she wrote Flannery a, uh, well, she wrote Walker Percy, let me say, not, maybe she wrote per, uh, she wrote Flannery a nine-page letter about a story, and she wrote Percy an 18-page letter. Uh, these are before the days of computer, where she went <laughs> sentence by sentence, and, and she would say, uh, you know, she actually sent Flannery O'Connor diagrams, sentence diagrams. She would diagram sentences, and she would, she would say, you know, that there's no such thing as, I think she said once, there's no such thing as an orange-colored moon. And she said, "You have to call it something else, but I, I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> and she would, she would, she would be uh, precise in every word. And then she would say, uh, she would take on anybody. You know, she would say, "You have, uh, you have one thing going for you that uh, uh, people like Hemingway don't have." And she said, "You know," and she would say, "You know, you don't have to recreate the universe every day. There's a given universe." And what she, what Gordon <laughs> meant by that was there was a Catholic worldview that was already in place yeah. for somebody like Flannery O'Connor, as it was for Dante. You know, whereas uh, uh, other writers are sort of so starting from scratch. Well, you did mention Walker Percy. He's another one of your favorites. Right. As well as a, f uh, a friend of Flannery? They were, they were, they were literary friends. Uh, as far as I can determine, they met once, maybe twice. Um, uh, this, Carolyn Gordon was encouraged, uh, encouraged Walker Percy in 1952 to call on her. But uh, kind of like this, uh, Percy was a late writer. He started writing novels. He's trained to be a medical doctor. He started writing novels in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. And the person that was inspiring him was O'Connor. She was sort of the... Hmm. Uh, the, uh, Percy came into the church in 1947. He read her fiction, and then, of course, uh, he 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 really had a wonderful uh, uh, thing that happened to him uh, when he won the National Book Award in 1960, kind of out of the blue, hmm. for his book *The Movie Goer*. Um, and after that, you know, he was he kind of had this uh, uh, this position, and that but that award was really providential. And he said, up until that point, he just he's a letter he said or in an essay he said, I, I beseech God every day to help this poor uh, struggling writer. You know, uh, that I'm just so pitiful. Uh, but w what happened is, uh, you know, uh, there was uh, there was some sort of. Uh, they couldn't quite decide in 1960 who could who should get the National Book Award, and then someone uh, advanced the movie goer uh, on on the committee, and and then he got he he was awarded it. Would you say the same thing for for Percy that you might say for Flannery that that the letters Walker's letters reveal his Catholicism so, uh, commitment and his, the level of his Catholicism that maybe uh, are more hidden or subtle in his in his literature. Uh, well, I would say, you know, he's got some essays, uh, and I'm, th there's another book of uncollected essays that I'm working on okay. called Confessions of a Miseducated Novelist, <laughs> which is basically his, uh, his, that's a term he used in one of his essays. Uh, but Percy's essays, if you work at it hard enough, uh, y you, will, you will see that he is a, a pretty strong apologist for Catholicism. But he did not consider apologetics and, as he said, preaching the function of a novelist. Right. So a lot of uh, what he does in his books, like a lot of students will say after they read O'Connor and they, they know exactly where 
she stands. They said, Where, where's the beef with this guy? And he's a different kind of Catholic. He, he, he's very incremental. He's very subtle in his novels. And uh, what's great about Percy is um, uh, you don't have to be shot on the side of the road to make that decision uh, to become serious about religion. Uh, you can you can you can become um, a practicing Catholic through daily sacrifice, through the nuances of ordinary faith, what Percy calls the, the holiness of the ordinary, uh, th that God is present in the holiness of the ordinary. We have an email uh, from George from Tennessee. How can good literature increase our appreciation and understanding of the Catholic faith? How can good literature increase our appreciation and understanding of the Catholic faith? Well, most good literature is religious in its uh, base, uh, either... Whether it admits it or not. Whether, like, like James Joyce, for example. That, I mean, Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man is, can increase your faith while Joyce is rebelling. Uh, I don't know of any literature uh, that is well crafted that's not religious in its in mm. its nature. So if you read good literature, uh, you're going to uh, sort of a byproduct of that is you're going to uh, increase your knowledge, increase you're going to become a, a more refined person, and uh, at the same time you're going to become, I think more uh, confirmed in your, in your Christian beliefs. You had mentioned that Shakespeare was a, a part of your own journey and the appreciation of Shakespeare. The, the interesting year we're in right now is it's the 400th anniversary of the King James Version mm -hmm. of the Bible, which has, again, the language, the beauty mm -hmm. of the language has had a big influence in that. And I'm wondering if, do you see that the change in our language over the years has uh, kind of lessened the beauty of our language and maybe the religious com the communication of our language at all. Oh yeah, I don't think there's any question that uh, the, the degradation or the mongrelization of, the, of language or, or the, has, has uh, lessened, as I, as I mentioned a minute ago, refinement, uh, uh, meaning, that kind of thing. But... Um, by the same token, um, there are many things in our world that would not have been understood in the 16th century. Yeah. You know, uh, some, some, so uh, I think you have to take, uh, to say that the 16th century was a time of, of superb, beautiful uh, use of the English language. And that's, that's sort of the touchstone. This is, this is an age of technology, uh, you know, an age of, of science. And... Uh, we need to we need to try to recover uh, yeah. our knowledge of some of the beauties of the English language of the past. I've almost wondered where we're in an age today where a, we use an LOL to communicate <laughs> right. something or a smiley face, and I'm to the point where when I have to sign letters, I can't even s slow my hand down enough to make my writing legible anymore because we just move so fast. Right, everything has moved fast. I do think for me. When I get absorbed in a good piece of literature, it tends to calm me, mm -hmm. slow me down, right. to maybe hear a message that in this crazy world you can't hear. Right. And to me, that's one of the values of great literature. Um, I, I know there's some pictures in front of us that we don't want to necessarily show on the TV, but one of them was of one of these priests, right? That was a, fun, a friend of Flannery. I think that was... Uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 I mentioned him, uh, this network, but this is uh, a picture I'm looking at here of Father James McCown, uh, who, and he and his Jesuit uh, uh, brother uh, were very instru instrumental, and he was friends with Walker Percy, too, okay. after, after right. O'Connor's Oca death. What's very interesting about McCown, uh, even, uh, he says, even though I was uh, trained as a Jesuit, he says, I, he says I'm not an academic. But he said, uh, one thing, he says, one thing I didn't learn in, liter in seminary was how to read literature. Mm -hmm. And so what he did in 1956 is he submitted for 10 years 
eight years until her death in 1964, uh, he submitted to uh, Flannery O'Connor's, uh, uh, to, to her being his tutor. And she recommended all kinds of books for him to read. And he actually, by, the, by 1964, had become quite well read in the area we're talking about. Um, uh, modern literature, um, Catholics as well as uh, other people. Uh, Father McCown read deeply into um, African American literature. He was good friends with uh, uh, and encouraged O'Connor to meet John Howard Griffin, who uh, was the guy who wrote Black Like Me. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, the guy who chemically darkened his skin mm -hmm. and uh, wrote a narrative about what it was like to travel through the segregated South. He, he was a Catholic convert. And uh, he, uh, he encouraged uh, O'Connor to, to meet him, uh, but she declined for various reasons. Um, she said, "If the one person I really want to meet is not a guy who chemically darkened his skin, but I really want to meet Muhammad Ali." And she said uh, she had heard his his rhymes, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she she was deeply attracted to him. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on her in the 1950s and 1960s to uh, make overt statements about the civil rights movement. And uh, Father McCown was heavily involved, very activist in the civil rights movement, um, as well as his friend who's part of this letters I'm, I'm editing, uh, Thomas Gossett, who was uh, also very, very heavily involved in civil rights activism. But Flannery had a limited amount of time. She was dying yeah, with lupus, lupus, and she uh, was very, very uh, reticent to put herself where she would be photographed uh, and appear in the Atlanta Journal uh, or some newspaper uh, taking a, an overt position on civil rights issues. And she was saying, you know, my fiction is, is speaks for my position. Right. Uh, some people castigate her for that, some, not cat, but criticize her for that. Uh, you know, but, but um, suffice it to say, she was very good friends with people who were uh, heavily uh, invested in the civil rights movement, one of which was Father McCown. And on the other side of the spectrum, uh, her mother was an old-fashioned uh, southerner of the 1950s who ran a dairy farm. And she admired her mother's authority on that farm. And she said uh, some of the feuds that she was able to end, uh, some of the feuding that was happening on the farm, uh, she said, I could not have been, a I was unable to do that. So she, she had, she respected both uh, her mother as well as her friends. Well, she was living at a unique time uh, with unique troubles in our country and world. You know, right. she's during World War II, the, the, the South in that time period in our country. And, and also, it, she was paralleling some other Catholic writers. Dorothy Day would have been a parallel, as well as Thomas Merton, Walker Percy, and her. And well, you know, there's a wonderful book uh, written by a friend of mine that, uh, called The Life You Save, uh, which is a f intertwined biography of those four That's, figures. That is a, yes. Paul, Paul um, Eli. Uh, uh, has is a beautiful book, and he's, he treats Merton, O'Connor, Percy, and and Dorothy Day, and interweaves all these people, which begins to put into uh, into literary history. You know, this this great uh, constellation of Catholic writers and activists in uh, in the mid century. Ben, we've only got a little bit of time left. I want if there's anyone out there that's interested in the work you're doing, both on Flannery and Walker Percy. Is there a way they can find out about what you're working, your projects you're working on right now? Well, uh, yeah, they can, they can uh, contact me at, at, uh, at, the, at the university, uh, B. Alexander at franciscan.edu. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I'd be willing, to, I'm happy to send them information. Uh, I'll be lecturing on these letters. Uh, there's, there's a wonderful conference at, uh, at Loyola University, uh, October 6th through 8th, called Flannery Among the Philosophers and Theologians, uh -huh. um, uh, put on by uh, Father Bosco, and, uh, who, who's a very fine Jesuit scholar. And uh, I'd be remiss if I, I, I didn't 
acknowledge too my, my great indebtedness to the Mary Flannery O'Connor Trust uh, and Father Michael Garanzini of uh, Loyola University and Louise Florin Court uh, of Milledgeville, Georgia, who have been so helpful in uh, allowing me to speak about these materials and uh, talk about them. All right. Thanks, Ben. Dr. Thank Alexander, thank, thank you, you very much for thank joining you. us on The Journey Home. Thank God you. bless for all your work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this good episode of The Journey Home with a good friend, Dr. Alexander. See you again next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.